So an angel appeared at a faculty meeting and told the dean of the college that in return for his unselfish and exemplary life, uh, he'll give him the choice of infinite wealth, wisdom, or beauty. Well, without hesitating, the dean said, wisdom. Done, the angel said, and then he disappeared. All the faculty members, they turned to the dean and one whispered, say something wise. The dean looked at them and said, I should have taken the money. <laughs> now, wisdom from a practical standpoint is something that's gained from experience. The wise person, they've been around the block for, for a little bit and they know that something like money is just a fact of life. We need a certain amount of money in order to make a living for ourselves, to provide for our families, maybe pay school tuition, and to have a certain amount of leisure as well. Uh, in seminary, seminarians, they always like to think about the spiritual life, about uh, helping uh, people grow in their holiness once they're priests and celebrating the sacraments. Um, but a wise person knows that there's two aspects to the parish. Uh, there's the spiritual side, which all the priests love, but then there's the administrative or business side where uh, the priests have to hire and fire people, they have to raise money, and they have to oversee the daily operations of a parish. I was reading a little bit about this practical wisdom the other day, and uh, in the article, the author spoke about a wise carpenter as someone who's been doing it a long time, so they know how hard to hit a nail, how to join a stubborn board to another, and how to fix a wall that's been bent out of shape. It's a practical wisdom that's learned from experience, and a young carpenter may not know all of this as well. Well, this wisdom, it helps us to make good decisions, and to a certain degree, it helps us to govern our lives as well. But there's another type of wisdom as well. It's a supernatural wisdom, what we call the gift of the Holy Spirit. It allows us to see things as God does and to govern our lives and the lives of others as, with God as our final end. It's something that King Solomon, he knew he needed in order to govern the Israelites. Uh, just after he became king, he summoned all of Israel, the commanders, the judges, the priests, uh, the, the princes of all Israel, and all the family heads, and he took them up a mountain to the tent of meeting in order to offer sacrifice to God. And after he did this, God spoke to him saying, whatever you ask, I will give you. Well, like the dean, Solomon asked for wisdom, and he asked for it because he was king over a large number of people, and he knew that he needed wisdom in order to govern them well. He needed it more than money, wealth, and power. And we see that in our first reading. We're told that he wanted wisdom more than scepter and throne, more than riches of gold and silver, and more than health. And one thing that this first reading really shows us is that Solomon's intentions, they are in the right place. He, des he desired something not for his own gain, not so that he could appear mighty and powerful in the world, but for God's glory and for the building up of God's people. It would be really interesting to do a survey today and uh, see how people would respond if God offered to give them anything they asked. I'd imagine that a lot of people would probably ask for some vain things, maybe a nice car, a mansion, winning the lottery, maybe superpowers nowadays. There's a lot of superhero movies. Um, but most would ask for things that uh, satisfy their selfishness or uh, that can be used on their passions. But the truth is, God gives the same offer to each and every one of us every day. He says, whatever we ask, he'll give us. And he says this much in scripture. Uh, Jesus, at one point, when he's speaking with his disciples, he tells them that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give you. But there's a little caveat with this as well. We have to know what to ask for, not things to use selfishly or for our own passions, but things to benefit us and others for our salvation and to bring glory to God. Solomon, he teaches us, he, I would say that he really teaches us um, how to know what to ask for. And um, he does it by showing us that we have to first properly order our lives to God. I mentioned that his intentions were in the right place um, when he asked for wisdom because 
uh, he placed God before everything else. One of his first acts as king was to offer sacrifice to God, to worship God. And um, he teaches us that, uh, that we have to order our lives to God in order to know what to ask for. And the first step of that is really um, giving God what is his due. Um, and, uh, and that would basically be coming to Mass every Sunday to participate in this sacrifice and giving fitting praise and worship to God. Um, But it's kind of easy today, I think, to come up with excuses not to go to Mass. Um, We get really busy in life. We have sports. Um, We may be tired from like a busy work week. Uh, One of my favorite excuses is that when people come up to me and say that uh, the priests don't give that good of homilies. And so, (laughs) hopefully this one's all right. (laughs) And so they don't feel like they're getting much out of the Mass. Um, But this kind of shows that there's a lot of different reasons or excuses that we can come up with in order not to go to Mass. And they can make, uh, like just the busyness of our life can really uh, make the Sunday obligation seem inconvenient or it can almost seem like uh, like the church is kind of forcing this on us to make our lives miserable. But Lawrence Feingold, he's the uh, author of a book called The Eucharist. Um, He explains the Sunday obligation very well. He says that it is first and foremost a duty to order creation in Christ back to God in a movement of praise and thanksgiving. The Mass sanctifies time by fulfilling the purpose of creation itself. Through creation, things move out from God into existence, but their purpose is to return again to him through glorifying him. And then he goes on to say that the Mass fulfills the true notion of leisure, in which one is free from constraints and deadlines, because one is doing that which is the goal of time itself, the glorification of God, by offering Christ and the Christian life back to the Lord. Now, obviously, it's nice when a priest gives a good homily, um, but we don't primarily come to Mass for the priest or the homily, We come to glorify God by participating in this sacrifice and by offering Christ and our lives back to God. Feingold, he also says that the uh, greatest act of uh, exterior act of religion, which religion is giving God what is his due, he says the greatest exterior act is sacrifice. And through sacrifice, the returning of something to God we express the spiritual ordering of, ordering of our souls to him so as to enter into fellowship with him. And so the first thing that we really have to ask God for is his help to properly order our lives to him. And once our lives are properly ordered, then like Solomon, we can ask for wisdom, which will help further govern our, our lives and govern um, other lives as well. And it helps us to see things from God's perspective. In our gospel today, our Lord told his disciples, There is no one who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now in this present age. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. Now, this doesn't mean that we're all going to be real estate magnets. We're going to have a bunch of houses and lands and live in mansions. Um, But what our Lord's promising here is really a spiritual abundance. In the promise of houses and lands, our Lord's referring to the church, where as a community of believers, we're meant to uh, share what we have and show hospitality to one another. Um, The brothers and sisters that he promises us are our fellow believers, those sitting right next to you in these pews. And then the, um, the, the children are our spiritual children, those that our Lord entrusts to us and that we have the responsibility to pray for and help get to heaven. But aside from these promises, there's one that kind of stands out a little bit. It seems a little awkward. Our Lord, he promises persecutions, which really doesn't sound like a blessing at all. But the gift of wisdom it helps us to see that persecutions and sufferings and really every kind of trial can be a blessing. 
St. Faustina, she's someone who suffered a lot in her life. She was a suffering soul, and her sisters, she thought that she faked her illnesses and the visions of God. Our Lord would appear to her almost every day. Um, but despite all the trials she went through, she could say that suffering is a great grace. Through suffering, the soul becomes like the Savior. In suffering, love becomes crystallized. The greater the suffering, the purer the love. Wisdom, brothers and sisters, allowed her to do this. For her to be able that for her to be able to say that suffering is the greatest treasure on earth. And there will be suffering and persecutions in our life if we're really living our faith. Because our lives and our faith, it contradicts the ways of the world. I'd say that the world kind of likes a more casual approach to religion where we kind of pick and choose uh, what we'll do and how often we'll go to Mass. And God, according to the world, God really becomes more of a buddy than our Creator and Savior. But Scripture, it helps us to put things into perspective. As we heard in our second reading, the Word of God is able to discern reflections and thoughts of the heart. It'll penetrate our hearts if we allow it to. It'll lay bare our intentions so that, like Solomon, we can properly order our lives to God and ask, the, ask for the things that'll benefit us for our salvation and bring greater glory and honor to God.